Good evening, everyone. And I know that you have had a wonderful, wonderful day. But hey, as they say, today is hump day. Two days left as far as the work week, and for some have to work on Saturday and even Sunday. But it is a joy to be able to come to you tonight for our Wednesday evening virtual Bible study. Last week, we started a study about the life of prayer. When you stop and think about the life of prayer, there has to be conception, there has to be birthing when you talk about life. And where does that actually transpire? Where does that take place in an individual's life? Well, it actually takes place when we see as mankind who is sinful, who is wicked, who is full of a life of debauchery and in need of a savior. And we see the holiness and the wonderfulness and the grace and the goodness and the purity of God. And we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Last week, for our example, we looked uh, at the Apostle Peter. And the Word of God declares in Luke, the 22nd chapter, and verse 62. Luke 22 and verse 62 the Word of God declares that Luke, well, uh, that Peter, in Luke 22 and 62, that Peter went out and wept bitterly. You say, well, what does that have to do with giving life to a life of prayer? It has everything to do with giving life because literally up until this time in Peter's life, Peter was egotistical. Peter was uh, self-sufficient, uh, if you will. Peter was a man of means, and Peter was a man of an ego size larger than the state of Texas, so to speak. And he declared to the Lord, I will not deny you. I will never deny you. And yet, the Lord replied to him and said, before the rooster even crows twice, you will have denied me three times. And truly, that's exactly what happened. And when Peter, on the third denial, denied Christ, even cursed him, Jesus' eyes were fixed upon him. Now, this is what I want you to see. Peter, up until that time, was a man, I'll never do that. Peter, up until that time, was a man who I'm sure of everything about myself. Peter, up until that time, could even declare to the Son of God, I will never, never deny you, but God. Oh, hallelujah, knowing all things, Jesus Christ, knowing the end from the beginning, knew that Peter would deny Christ. And on that third denial, the Lord, the scripture says, looked at Peter. He fastened his eyes upon Peter. He didn't turn from Peter. See, that's the grace of God, beloved. The Lord does not turn from us. We're the ones that do the denial. We're the ones that are so full of self. We're so full of an ego until we say, oh, I'm like Peter. I'll never... But Christ never took his eyes off of Peter. And the word of God said he fastened his eyes upon Peter. And when Peter saw himself, if you will, when Peter saw his humility, when Peter saw his uh, fragileness, when Peter saw himself broken, he became contrite before God because he saw himself as sinful man. And he, at that time, went out, according to Luke 22 and 62, and wept bitterly before God. Now, beloved, this is when life began to transpire into the prayerfulness of the apostle Peter when he was willing to be broken. And that's what I want us to see tonight. 
What really brings life into the life of prayer is a broken and a contrite spirit. You see, there's power in prayer, and there's power in prayer that takes place during the proper attitude of being broken. He says in Psalms 51 in verse 17, Therefore sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. And then in Psalms 34 and 18, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such that be of a contrite spirit. You see, beloved, God cannot use a person who is not broken and fully surrendered unto him. To be broken is to see yourself as a vessel, a vessel in the hand of the potter, if you will, a vessel as a clump of clay that must be pliable, that must be workable, that must be broken. The Word of God declares in Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, turn there, if you will, Jeremiah, the 18th chapter. I'll give you time to turn there in your scripture. The word of God declared to Jeremiah the prophet that Israel was as a clump of clay. Israel being chosen of God. Israel being God's uh, heartthrob. Israel being the people that was chasing and running after the very heart of God. Yet Israel had become marred even in the hand of the potter. You see, again, nobody can pluck you out of the hand of God. And this is why it was said of Peter there that he went out and wept bitterly, but the Lord Jesus kept his eyes upon Peter. And yet the Lord says to Jeremiah as he went down to the potter's house and he saw there as the potter wrought a work on the wheel. The wheel was going around. And the wheel, as it spun around, it had the clump of clay. But the potter kept, kept his hands on that clay. As the clay was going around and around on that potter's wheel, the scripture said it became marred in the hands of the potter. In other words, the Lord did not throw the clay away. Oh, praise God. But as the clay became marred in the hand of the potter, the potter, oh hallelujah, took that clay and made it again a vessel that seemed good unto the potter to make it. And this is what I want you to see. In Jeremiah 18 and 6, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. A piece of clay that has become pliable a piece of clay that has become workable, a piece of clay that has become broken and contrite before God. Oh, hallelujah. He's talking about me and he's talking about you, beloved. We must be broken. We must have a contrite heart. We must understand that when a person's heart is broken, that heart heart resist, being full of pride and boastful. Therefore, the man, the woman, the young person can be of greater use to God when he or she has a life of prayer with a broken attitude. You see, once we sense our lack, if you will, in our own natural qualifications to be in the holy presence. Oh, hallelujah. 
of a holy God, we begin to confess, we begin to humble ourselves uh, under the mighty hand of God and exemplifying a true spirit of brokenness, of a contrite spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This, beloved, is when we can have what I call a then in our life. T-H-E-N, a then in our life. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter, and the 14th verse. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. The Word of God speaks, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and will pray and will seek my face. Now get this. If my people will turn from their wicked ways, then, oh hallelujah, <laughs> praise God, then, then, beloved. You see, it's not until we become humble and contrite before God that we literally give birth to a life of prayer to experience a then because when we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek the Lord, we see the wickedness, we see all of the frailty, we see all the sinfulness in our own heart that must be brought to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that must be sanctified by the washing of the word, that must be empowered by the filling of, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. He says, then, what's this? I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will do what? Heal their land. May I be quite honest with you? Is this not what we need across the globe tonight? Right here, right here, I have emails from church leaders talking about what's happening in the Ukraine. Here, I have pictures that are given of boys and girls and, and children that are running for their lives to Poland and to the other countries trying to get out of harm's way. These are people that have prayed. These are people that are seeking God. You see, beloved, you're not the only one that's in need of God tonight. Our entire world is in need of God. Amen. Floyd County is not the only county that's in need of prayer tonight. No, beloved. The state of Georgia is not the only state in need of prayer tonight. No, but this entire globe needs a Holy Ghost revival. And it begins in the body of Christ. It begins in that clump of clay. It begins in me and you who know God, who profess that we know the Lord because we've experienced God. We've got to quit playing church. We've got to take the veneer of religiosity off and say, Oh God, as Peter, I weep bitterly before you. I humble myself before you. I pray unto you, dear Lord. I seek your face with a contrite spirit, and I'm willing to turn from my wickedness and my evil ways. Oh, blessed God, does not the word of God declare that man's heart is desperately wicked? This is why we've got to pray. This is why we've got to have a life of prayer, if you will. This, beloved, is what I literally mean when I say continuing before God in the righteousness of God, in the holiness of God. Oh, hallelujah, keeping the proper attitude, an attitude of brokenness before God, enabling God to literally hear our prayers because a proud heart, a heart full of pride, God resists, but a heart that is broken, a heart that is contrite, Oh, hallelujah, he embraced. Watch this, watch this. James, the fourth chapter and the sixth verse. But he giveth more grace. 
unto the humble. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. God resists the pride, but gives grace. His unmerited, unearned favor to the humble. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. To the humble. If we are of a broken and a contrite spirit before God, God will give more grace. That means unearned favor. Favor that cannot be purchased with man's abilities because we're nothing without God. When are we going to learn that we're still mud people without God breathing into this clump of clay? We're nothing without God, but with God, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. The word of God declares greater works than these shall you do if we would just humble ourselves. So therefore, success is based, beloved, on the grace of God as he gives grace unto the person that is broken, truly broken, before him. Truly given over to him. Because, you see, we simply... We cannot do anything successful on our own merits. But by His divine grace, we can do all things. So this comes by being broken and having a true spirit of humility before God. Oh, hallelujah. It's a joy. For us as believers to know that God is literally shaping our lives as that clump of clay of Jeremiah 18. And that he is using us for his eternal purpose. That word that you spoke in due season to someone this week, it has an eternal purpose. That embrace that you gave to someone exemplifying the love of God has an eternal purpose. Oh, you see, beloved, we must understand that there are souls that are weighing in the balance tonight, and we don't have time to play. We, we, there's been enough strain. There's got to be a return to the altars of prayer because therein lies the power of a child of God's life. Therein lies the ability for us to rise in the power of this holy book, the power of Pentecost, the power of the anointing. Oh, hallelujah. The scripture declares in Luke 4, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach this gospel. But it's empowered through a life of prayer. As I said last week in our, in our study, Jesus was the one who exemplified for us the best when it comes to a life of humility and a life of a broken and humble heart surrendered to God. Did he not pray in the garden, Father, let thy will be done? That's brokenness before before God. That's a spirit of humbleness before God. Too many today is wanting to do their own thing. You know, when are we going to wake up and come out of this worldly, drunken, carnal stupor and understand we've got to shake this world off and hit the altars again and return to a biblical lifestyle of prayer, of brokenness, of humility, and of a contrite heart. For when we do this, we will see the eternal purpose. After all, is not God working, uh, I believe it's Romans 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for the good of them who love God and are called according to his purpose. So I ask you, as I conclude our study tonight, Is this not where it starts? With a spirit of humility. 
humbling ourselves before God as Jesus taught the disciples our Father which art in heaven oh hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done bring self under subjection what is it that you're wrestling with what is it that, that's keeping you from, from moving forward I ask you would you consider giving your all to God, humbling yourself to God? It will not make you a less person. It will make you a powerful person in the power of the Spirit of the living God. Oh, hallelujah. Last week, the Bible study went for 50 minutes. Because I simply wanted to lay the groundwork for this life of prayer. Tonight, we have not gone 50 minutes. But it's not the length that someone teaches or that someone may speak or preach. It is what is said during that moment. And I want to ask you as we conclude our study this evening. Would you once again look at yourself. Because only you and God, just like no one knows me like I do, and God, would you consider yourself taking the light of God's holy word and let it penetrate your heart as the eyes of the Lord did. When the eyes of the Lord looked upon Peter, when Peter denied him, the eyes of the Lord, and he went out and wept bitterly before God. Are you willing to allow the light of God's holy word to shine upon your heart that you may weep bitterly before God and say, Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, don't refuse me. Too many people are dependent upon you. And, beloved, hear me. I know what I'm talking about. If you will pray, you will not lose heart. This is why the scripture said, Mankind should always pray and not faint. Don't lose heart now. Jesus is coming. Have you listened to the current events today? <laughs> hey, hey, I, I just got off the phone less than an hour ago with some of our leading church leaders in the church of God telling me what's going on and what's happening in Poland, what's happening in the Ukraine, how you and I are joining together with our finances and with our prayer life and what God is doing. Let me tell you something, beloved. No matter what the devil is, is trying to throw out there, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, hallelujah, is rising. And we're rising above the circumstances and the situations because of our prayer life. So don't pass out. Don't lose heart. Have a life of prayer. Let's pray. Father, I love you, Lord. And I give you praise and I give you honor. Knowing, dear Lord, tonight that as this, this study has gone out, upon the life of prayer. God, we've got to pray. We've got to pray as never before. We've got to do it in a spirit of humility, in a spirit of a contrite spirit. And oh, God, help us tonight, I pray. Touch my brothers and touch my sisters, Lord. Regardless of, Lord, what our background is, we are all one by the blood of the crucified and resurrected Lamb of God. Tonight, Lord, hear our prayers. Touch our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. Touch our brothers and sisters that are opening their borders. Oh, Lord, tonight, touch our brothers and sisters right here at home who are under a burden, who are carrying a load, who are sick and afflicted. Lord, does not your word declare, call unto me and I will answer thee. I will show thee great and mighty things. Does not your word declare, if we will pray and humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. Oh, dear Lord, you would open the windows of heaven. You would bend your ear and you would hear our prayer. Oh, God, tonight we pray with expectation and we're calling upon you tonight to move and to minister, Lord, your perfect will in Jesus' name. Amen. 
and amen. May God richly bless you. Please join us again next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock as we continue our study in the life of prayer. God bless.